scripture readings uh, this morning. Uh, the first one comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2. Uh, and this may be familiar to you from uh, Pentecost Sunday. I think you've probably heard it once or twice uh, in the course of your time of worshiping uh, in the church. We'll hear it again all the same. Hear this word. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All of them were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they're filled with new wine." is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our second reading this morning comes from uh, Paul's letter uh, to the Ephesians. Uh, We're in chapter one of that book. We've been working through Ephesians uh, for a few weeks now, um, and we've made it to verse 11. We'll go all the way through uh, the book of Ephesians over the course of the summer, and I encourage you, if you have not already, to pick up the habit of reading it. Uh, Whether slowly, maybe a chapter at a time each week, you can make it through the whole book over the course of six days, uh, or if it's better for you to sit down and read it all the way through, I encourage you to get more and more acquainted with this letter that articulates uh, for us the gospel of Jesus. Hear this word. In Christ we've also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in Him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of His glory. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me and for me now? Oh Lord, you know better than anyone how dense and hard-headed we can be. Even so, we ask that your Spirit, that did such amazing things on Pentecost, would open us now to the goodness of your Word. That it would open us to have your Word written on our hearts. That it would open us to believe your Gospel for the first or millionth time. That you, O Lord, are healing us, that you're saving us, that you are redeeming us, that you're doing that not just for us, but as a part of your mission to save the whole world. So we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Let the church say, Amen. One of my favorite hymns is The Church's One Foundation, and one of the reasons I love it is is because of verse 4. The church shall never perish, it says. Her dear Lord to defend, to guide, sustain, and cherish is with her to the end. Though there be those that hate her and false sons in her pale, against the foe or traitor she ever shall prevail. This verse is sometimes hard for us to believe because we've seen the statistics just in the last month it's come out that fewer than than 50% of people identify as Christians in the United States any longer. It feels like we can see that sometimes in the attendance of the local church, right? If you look at church attendance uh, in our town, in our state, in the country, it's trending downward. And we worry that the church will die. But on Pentecost, we learn and we remember 
that the church is not constituted by our actions or our abilities, but that the Holy Spirit was sent by Jesus to bring the church to life. Oftentimes the Holy Spirit is the forgotten member of the Trinity because the Holy Spirit never seeks out any attention itself and it always points us to Jesus who brings us to the Father. But Pentecost we celebrate often as the birthday of the church. This is the, uh, this is the beginning of the story of Acts, which is the story of the church, how the gospel goes from being something that's shared just among the, the apostles and the, the others who follow Jesus to spreading all the way across uh, Europe and Asia and parts of Africa. This is the story of how what started as a very small movement in Jesus' ministry begins to go, as, as Matthew says, all the way to the ends of the earth. And all of that movement is rooted in the first movement of the Holy Spirit. The creeds tell us that the Holy Spirit is the Lord, the giver of life. The Latin word for spirit is, is animus. It is the thing that animates us, the thing that brings us to life, the thing that gives us, the, 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 that has the power to transform us and that empowers us then to go forth and love and serve and share the good news of Jesus. One thing that sometimes makes us uncomfortable is that the Spirit is not under our control. We have to remember that even though it's not under our control and leaves us a little bit, a little bit feeling unmoored, without the Spirit, all of the work of the church is in vain. Without the Spirit, our Worship is in vain. Without the Spirit, Bible school will be in vain. Without the Spirit, our study of Scripture is in vain. Because it was the Spirit that was there at its writing and the Spirit that's there at its reading that gives us a chance to encounter God through the words of Scripture. So as Paul writes to the church at, Ephes at Ephesus, or maybe not at Ephesus as we, as we talked about when we started the letter, as Paul writes this letter, he speaks about an inheritance, an allotment that we are to receive, a portion that will be ours. And this word uh, in inheritance, it, it comes from a word for casting lots. And so it indicates to us that the, the portion that we're receiving, the, the part that we're receiving, is not merited by us, it's just a gift. And if it's a, if it's a portion, if it's an allotment, it's a part of something larger, right? And if it's a part of something larger, what is that? Well, Paul just told us in, in verse, uh, verses 8 through 10 that we talked about two weeks ago that the will of God before the foundations of the world has been revealed to us and that the mystery of God's will is that God in Jesus Christ is gathering everything up, uniting everything up together in Jesus. The whole world, all of the universe, is being gathered up into Jesus. The world that's been torn apart by human sin, that has pulled away at the fabric of the universe, that's, 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 that's ripped it apart, is being gathered back up together in Christ. And we get to participate in that. We get a little portion of it. This is our inheritance. That the grand plan of God that's been revealed to us in Jesus, we get to participate in it. And, and Paul makes a distinction here that, that kind of confuses things if, if you're not reading really carefully. But he's been using we all the way through, and, and then he makes a distinction between the we. In, in verse 12, or in verse 11, he says, We've attained that inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things, so that we who were, first, who were first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of His glory. He's speaking about the apostles, right? The very first people who began to follow Jesus. The Spirit has given them, has given them an inheritance. And then He turns and says, in Christ you also, those of you who've come to believe because of our ministry, are abiding in the same Spirit. And then he, he says something that's a little bit odd to us. He says, you are sealed in the Holy Spirit. Which when we hear that, a lot of times when we talk about seals, we talk about things that are, that are bound together, right? If, if your container has a good seal, it means nothing's getting in or out. 
Uh, if your hose has a good seal, it's not shooting water everywhere, right? Uh, well, that, that's related, but this seal is the seal that would have been like a signature in the ancient world. Like, do they still do the good housekeeping seal of approval? Is that still a thing? But the seal that gets stamped on something so that you know it has a brand and identity and something that you can trust. Or in the ancient world, if, if you were sending a letter, uh, you would seal it with your seal. You'd have a stamp made of wood or carved into rock or whatever else, and you would pour wax onto the document and you would put your seal on it that it would be really hard for anyone else to replicate so that they knew it was coming from you. Or some of you, I don't know if if kids still do this because they just text message now, but when you wrote a note in junior high and you wrote sealed with a kiss at the bottom, right? This is the kind of seal that we're talking about. A mark that indicates from whom it has come to whom it belongs that gives it an identity. And this is what Paul says the Holy Spirit does for us. It marks us. And the mark looks like the Holy Spirit. In other words, the work that the Holy Spirit is doing is putting into us the image of God. The image of God that we were made to bear from the very beginning is being restored in us by the work of the Holy Spirit. We have the mark of God on our lives because of what Jesus is doing in us. We start to look more and more like God as we were created to be. That's the mark that should be visible in the Christian life. And he goes further and he says that this mark is the guarantee, the down payment, the earnest money that God gives us for our inheritance. Now, you might just run right over that, but this is a really dense idea. All of this to the praise of His name. So, this is, this is what He's saying. This is how we enter into what Christ offers to us. He gives us this seal. This seal becomes for us the pledge or the guarantee of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people to the praise of His glory. So what he means is, if, you, if, you have a, if you're buying real estate and the person's like, I'm not really sure that you're as interested as you're pretending to be, you say, here, here's some portion of what I'm going to pay so that you know I'm negotiating in good, good faith. It's earnest money. It's, it's what you give to say, I'm serious about this work. You can trust it's going to happen. This is my guarantee that I'm going to proceed with this sale. And Paul says that's what the mark of the Holy Spirit is for us. is a sign that God who has begun work in us is going to be faithful to complete it all the way to the end. The work has begun, but it's not yet finished. The world is not yet all gathered up in Jesus Christ. We talked last week or two weeks ago about how the will of God is to draw everything up into Jesus. This is the mystery of God's will from before the foundations of the earth. And if that hasn't happened yet, we don't have the inheritance yet. And that's good news in one sense. Because the world as it is is not as good as it's going to get. The best is yet to come. And it's also some bad news. The world is still broken and is not united in the way that God wants it to be. The will of God has not yet been completed in the world. Not everything that happens is the way that God wants it to be. That's why we pray week after week when we pray the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's not that way yet. And there are preachers and teachers who say they are teaching the gospel, who are preaching and teaching a lie. Lies, the best lies, are always subtle. 
They're never obvious. They, they, they sound like the truth until you really dive into them. And this lie takes a lot of different forms. But what it sounds like is if you're faithful and obedient to God, it will guarantee that life will be all that you have hoped for. Your marriage will be perfect. The marriage that you're hoping for will be provided to you. Your life will be perfect. Your kids will be perfect. You'll have health and wealth and prosperity. If you are faithful, God will give you the desires of your heart. And this is a lie straight from the best liar that the world has ever known because it sounds like the hope of the gospel. And we see throughout all of the gospels of Jesus, throughout his ministry, that he's healing people, that he is restoring them, that he is delivering them from things that oppress them, that he is offering them the abundance of the Father's life as he feeds 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. We see the abundance of God. We see the ways that God's power breaks through. And we think that that's the way life always ought to be. That if we're faithful, that will be the way that life is day in and day out for the rest of our lives. And if life isn't that way, then either we're not faithful enough or the promises of God aren't true. With this lie, those are the only options. But it is a lie. It's not a good thing to try to get the whole inheritance early. There's a story about this in Scripture that I told yesterday at the Embrace Grace baby shower. The story of a son that Jesus tells in Luke 15 who goes to his wealthy father and he says, God, I want, Dad, I want you to go ahead and give me what should be mine, what will be mine in the future. I'd like to have it now. And that son goes out and he wastes his inheritance all on all kinds of things that, that no, no child of God should ever spend money or attention or their body on. And he finds himself lost wanting to go back home. When he does, his father welcomes him. And then we learn more about the older son who's been at his father's house the whole time being perfectly obedient to everything his father has asked him to. And when the younger son comes back, the older son gets bitter. He says, Dad, you've never even thrown me a small party. Why are you rewarding such terrible behavior? We learn that the older son, like the younger son, but in a very different way, is only interested in what the father can give him. They're both interested in their father as a kind of vending machine to provide them with what they want and the fun they'd like to have. Both of them, it turns out, fail to be interested in their father, in the relationship that they have abiding in their father's house. The inheritance that is awaiting for us is the restoration of all things, a world that will know no tears, a world that is perfectly constituted with no grief, no suffering, no sickness, no sighing, no, no sadness. And right now, right now what we have is, is a seal, a mark of the Holy Spirit that is the guarantee of the inheritance that's coming, not the whole thing. I know, I know y'all have not noticed but around Winona, there are some cracks in places in the road and the sidewalks. And from those cracks sprouts up little, little life, right? Sometimes it's annoying that it's there. But all the same, it, it breaks through. The, the pavement has been designed to, to knock out all the life, and yet it comes through. And this is what the Holy Spirit does in the meantime as we wait for the fullness. Where the Holy Spirit moves, there is life and beauty and goodness. But it is not everywhere. And it can sprout up anywhere. There is nowhere that God's miracles and power cannot be seen. But the guarantee is not that right now we will have the fullness of the inheritance. The guarantee is the work of the Holy Spirit among the people of God pulling us towards that redemption that has been promised. That God will liberate us from everything that holds us down so that we can live in freedom and beauty and goodness without any need for anything. Right now, the pledge of the inheritance is the mark of the Holy Spirit among God's people.
And all of this, Paul says, is towards the praise of the glory of Jesus. So the praise of his name. He, he says this twice, by the way. He says it about the apostles, that, that God has been at work in them and they have been at work through the power of the Spirit for the praise of his glory. And then he says it about the church that's following him. Do you see this? It's, it's at the end of verse 12. It's at the end of verse 14. The same phrase both time. To the praise of his glory. This is what discipleship looks like. This is what the work of the Holy Spirit looks like in the church over time. That the purpose of Paul and the other apostles becomes the purpose of the church that Paul is writing to centuries ago becomes the purpose of the church that reads his letter now. That everything we do as the people of God who've been marked by the Holy Spirit, everything goes towards the praise of his glory. It's the one thing that we focus on. To praise the name of Jesus with our lips and with our lives. The guarantee has come. The seal has been offered to you. And you can receive it today if you haven't received it before. Paul lays it out pretty plainly. We'll talk about it more over the next few weeks. But he says it pretty clearly. In him, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you received the Holy Spirit. Today you've heard the gospel. That Christ is bringing everything into himself. He's making all things new. And that you can have a place in that. You have a portion allotted to you, even now, to begin participating in the life with God. And this, the inheritance at the end of it, when, when you offer earnest money, you offer it in the same currency as what you'll give for the final payment, right? Right? If you give dollars, you're going to give dollars or whatever else. The down payment, the guarantee, is the Holy Spirit. Which means that at the end of the day, the inheritance is nothing less than relationship with God Himself. This is what He offers to us. This is the gospel for us that if you hear it and believe it, that God wants to heal you and save you and mark you as a sign of his life breaking through in a dark world, it will come. The Holy Spirit will mark you too and restore the image of God in you that you can faithfully bear the image of God to the world, that you can be a sign of the coming full inheritance where all of the world is in right relationship with God. If that's something that you want today, I pray that you will receive it If it's something you'd like to talk further about, I would be thrilled to talk to you about that this week. If it's something that you want to receive, you can ask God to give it to you even now. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your gospel. We pray that you would deliver us from all lies that sound similar to your gospel. We know, O Lord, that Paul lived with a thorn in his flesh for all of his life, that his whole ministry was one of running out of town, being run out of town by people who didn't like him, suffering and persecution and trials, and ultimately martyrdom. This was the case for all of your apostles. We know that your son Jesus, who was the most faithful and obedient human who has ever lived, died. And we expect no less for ourselves, O Lord. We know that the world is not yet as it should be. And we pray that your Spirit would give us exactly what we need as individuals and as a congregation that are of people that are being redeemed to persevere through whatever comes our way. That you would fill us with hope, with the guarantee that you have offered to us, the fullness of the inheritance that our relationship with you can be as much as ever we could ask or imagine. We pray, Lord, for any who do not know the hope in Christ today. We pray that by your grace they might receive it, that they might begin to follow after Jesus faithfully along with your church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.